and Woody. One named Peter, one named Paul. Slow away, Peter. Come back, Peter. Come along. Everything seemed to be falling to place. She'd completed her studies on exceptionally well. She's doing a master's. Um, and that's the situation we were before our, our lives turned upside down, really. Um, well, our firstborn was um, Amani. She came along in um, 1998. Um, we were both quite wanting to have a girl, weren't we? We were quite yeah. hopeful that we, our first was going to be a girl. And we quite early on chose the name Amani. And she was just an absolute dream, wasn't she? She was yeah, like, just perfect full, of, child. full of character, always talking nonstop, always asking questions, always um, happy, singing all the time, just, yeah, full of, uh, sort of bundle of joy, wasn't she? Yeah, definitely. Perfect yeah. first child, really. Yeah, that's right. Um, my name is Amani Liaka. Um, I'm 23 years old. Um, I was born in Luton and I've pretty much lived here my whole life. I've got two younger sisters, I'm the eldest. Just spent pretty much all our time outside of school just making up games like forts under the table and all that kind of stuff. I don't really remember us ever fighting, maybe that's because we're sisters. Um, yeah, dad coming home from work and then spending like hours just throwing us around on the sofa, pretending that the floor was like lava and just very basic. We didn't have loads of money, but we weren't really struggling either, just happy. And she's always pretty much been the life and soul of our family because she's always been that person. She's always sort of shared her life with us. So when she goes out with friends, she was always pinging us like photos and would come home and just sit there and retell a whole long story of what they'd got up to and the funny parts and not so funny parts or whatever. So that was always, we always look, looked forward to her coming home. Yeah. So we, yeah. Because we knew it'd be like story time. Nan is just known for being the storyteller. <laughs> yeah. She made us really proud when she got her first, uh, you know, you know, in law in, uh, in Leicester, where she stayed for the University of Leicester, where she stayed for three years. So, I mean, you know, I think she's been an inspiration. You know, we've been really proud of her and she's been an inspiration, set a benchmark for her sisters as well. So, and in my family, on my side, she's the first grandchild, so she's always had that special status. Mm -hmm. Everyone says they're the best years of your life and I did really feel like that. So I wasn't ready for it to be over just yet. I've seen your daughter just 100 percent you know normal and healthy just moments before and it just I just was it was just didn't feel didn't seem like it was my daughter in front of me and I just was like my whole body was just shaking because mm. it was just you know I didn't know what to do I didn't know how to help I didn't know what was going on I can't explain even how I felt in that moment because I just I don't remember it and I think that's the only way I was able to get through that time not having visitors was because my body knew you can't cope with all of this trauma, so you're just not going to process it. So I just think I just I just switched off, like I was on the outside looking in, rather than actually me going through it. Then we got a telephone call a couple of hours later, didn't we, saying one of you needs to come in, and then we knew something was not. But they actually said that we found something in the CT scan from that. It looks like. It's, um, I think he actually said, it looks like it's glioblastoma, which is a grade four. Um, and, you know, did sort of go down the prognosis route, told us that as well in this like very quick conversation. And then, but we, you know, I can remember you quick questioning him saying, but how can you tell? You haven't done a biopsy, so how can you tell? And he goes, you know, hopefully I'll be proved wrong, but in my experience, it looks like it's a, a GBM four. Um, 
But if it's not, then you're looking at, you know, if it was a lower grade, then maybe maybe you've got like, you're looking at decades um, for Armani and whatever. So that was just... I think for us, it was just a, a shock to be told. Because again, these sort of conversations you'd have in hospital face to face. And we were having this on a telephone call and you're telling us that, oh, your daughter's going to be living for 12 to 18 months. We were all sort of dying at home. It was just like so, you know, the, the way your body hurts and aches when you sort of, uh, in, in this sort of situation, it was just just so painful physically and, and emotionally. But when we were on the phone to Amani in the video chats with Amani, I mean, she was just a breath of fresh air, wasn't she? Because she was just laughing and joking. <laughs> and it was nice to see her just as, as, as her being normal. But again, I think that was maybe a coping strategy or that she just quite wasn't, wasn't quite understanding what was going on. While Amani was having her radiant chemotherapy, which was uh, 30 sessions uh, to her brain, so five days a week, every morning we had to travel to um, uh, Mount Vernon Hospital near London, take her every morning and she'd get, you know, this treatment, just quite intense and aggressive, then bring her home and then she'd sleep and have a breakfast and, and that was her whole life for, you know, um, six weeks. And in that time we were looking at other options and hoping that um, the treatment would work or at least reduce the tumour. I wanted to pretend it wasn't happening as much as possible. Um, my dad would ask all these questions, but what about this and what about that? Um, and I would just get upset because I didn't want to be there. I didn't want to listen to it. Uh, you know, I said to dad, I was like, why do you keep saying, but what if it doesn't work? Because in my head, I was like, that's not a thing. It does work. Yeah, unfortunately, people do pass away from cancer. But in this like day and age, most of the things you hear are like success stories. And so I was just frustrated and upset, like, with my dad for even mentioning these things. But then obviously as I slowly became more aware, he just knew what I didn't, was the fact that for majority of people, this doesn't work. I think at that time I was sort of, actually, I didn't understand why everyone was looking at different treatments and talking about different countries and all that, because I just wanted, you know, to keep money as close to home as possible. And, you know, just wanted to believe that the NHS had all the answers and it would just be a straightforward treatment and whatever, but we just continually we were getting told, you know, you know this won't, isn't a cure, you know this isn't a cure, and that's what, what we always work with. Yeah, and they just told, it was almost like they were preparing us for the worst. Yeah, so weekly I have to prepare all of Marnie's medication, which is quite a lot. Yeah, I'm going to have to in the UK, especially for like seriously ill patients, we can do that. that should be a very important uh, measure. This first set of medication, then with breakfast she takes the, this one, and then we've got lunch, and then at half past five she has this set of medications, um, then this is with dinner, and then this will be like when she has a snack about 10 o'clock at night, or around that time, and then there are, then she'll take a few more of, of these at bedtime, so that's basically I'm not sure, maybe even 30 tablets a day, possibly. So that's a lot for her to take. But she doesn't grumble too much about it, which is quite good. There are too many families being told by their NHS clinicians that there isn't anything else that can be done for them. Uh, and I think there are too many clinical pathways in the in the UK that are very traditional that might not be the best for patients and not uh, take advantage of some of the innovations that are being seen elsewhere in the world. And I think it's a tragedy that people with sick children, sick partners, sick parents are having to spend time to not only research their own treatments or, or, or options for new treatment pathways, but to apply for them and then to self-fund them. And, and the money involved is not small. We're talking hundreds of thousands of pounds for people to fly their children out to uh, the United States or, or for, payer, uh, for, for people to access treatments uh, um, um, related to dendritic cells and immunotherapy in Germany. This is expensive stuff. And, and if we are at the forefront of the life sciences revolution, surely we should be leading in that area too. More and more people are coming along with terrible tales of, of premature loss and of suffering 
and, and people are realising that actually the, 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 the power is with the government to, to fund research into this area to really make a difference and, and, and that's what we've got to do. And I think we've all had a bit of a boost from uh, COVID in terms of that. You know, there we are, with forefront vaccine, done that. But we've done it because we've, we've put a lot of money into it and we've done it because we did things differently in a, in a kind of like a, a parallel fashion. So that as the science was um, w was being conducted, they were getting stuff ready for rollout. Whereas in drug delivery, new drugs, it's kind of like science, trials, rollout, production. You know, you know it's not done in a linear fashion. So I think if we can be a bit more, um, bit more like we have been there, that will be a good thing. This is a um, branch of a research magazine that came through the post today. Um, we, we actually do a lot of uh, work with the branch of research. Um, they're really good at sort of campaigning about the lack of funding and um, do a lot of work with that. And they raise funds for research. So Marnie was involved in a, um, a media campaign that they did. So she was actually um, filmed for a, their um, advert. So it was a day, day's filming in London. So this is just, it was featured in the, in the actual magazine as well. Penny, Penny. But Marnie was getting severe headaches and so they brought forward her scan to late August and uh, they then did the scan and they said look sometimes it gives a false reading but we don't think it's a false reading in Amani's case we think her tumour's grown and so the radiotherapy has not worked and so very quickly we booked the flight to Germany and my, um, obviously Amani can't travel and so um, my brother-in-law and myself, we travelled. And we'd done a fundraising page, hadn't we? Yeah, and the GoFundMe we had to set up because of the, the, this is obviously the Onc201 drug is um, on a private basis. So you can buy it um, from a, a doctor in a pharmacy in Germany. Um, but it's literally £1,000 a week um, to, to fund that. So just so four um, tablets a week. So there was no way that we were able to, to do that. So we just set up a, a GoFundMe page, um, which was absolutely amazing the, the response within 24 hours we um, it raised 107 thousand pound when I found out about the lack of funding um, I think it just made a bad situation even worse because it just made you feel like so why has brain cancer research been left on the back burner why is why is the investment not been there you know if the same investment had been made so many years ago, then we potentially would be in a, a very different situation now. Um, so, you know, it does make you upset and angry, really. Yeah. People don't realise how many young babies get this disease. You know, uh, we know many families, their children are one, two, three years old. Uh, you know, many of them uh, die before the age of 10 and um, they've got their whole lives ahead of them. And if so, if people who who are just starting on this journey, we tend to share Armani's podcast or, or Instagram, as well as giving the information that we've accumulated over time. And then people know what to expect, possibly with their journey. Yeah, that was going to be loads of people just us three girls, just like singing our hearts out. They were like, you know, it's nearing exam season. You should really, like, who's in here? And it was just, we all live here. There's no one extra. Most of my strength comes from my family and the people around me. I know that if I didn't have that support system, I would have, I wouldn't be here. There are a lot of people that don't have families as aware as my family were. And I just, I worry for them. If it wasn't for the fact that we were able to use social media to raise the money, if it wasn't a fact that we were able to use the internet to research these things and look into those things, there is no doubt in my mind that I would not be here. I just think that if there is collective outrage, if there's just a few solo voices and solo stories, it's not enough to get people to care. I just think if we can do events like that and we can make a movement of sorts, that maybe people will finally listen. It's not just destroyed her dreams, it destroyed our dreams and hopes for her. It's had a huge psychological impact on her sisters um, and my parents and your parents and, you know, uncles and aunts, so, and even her friends, sure, you know. Friends, yeah. The one last thing I'd just like to say is that um, 
you know, it's, it's good, good that we've got the opportunity to, to share our story. But, you know, in this journey, we've met such wonderful people that have sadly have lost their lives. Um, you know, Mohammed, um, Sabrina, and then just recently Matthew, um, which Marnie, and we all got very close to them. And obviously when you have a shared experience, you get even closer. Um, and with each one that, that, that passes, it's difficult for Amani, but she vows to fight on in their honour. I do think that, yeah, maybe it might be too late for me, but what about other families? I'm not going to be, I'm not the first person to be diagnosed with a cancerous brain tumour and I'm not going to be the last one. And people that have been through other treatment journeys with other cancers, they've seen the development in treatments and they've seen the change in survival rates just in the year and a half that i've been unwell i've lost friends from the brain tumor community my age younger and sometimes i feel ungrateful for even complaining and struggling i want to do what i can because they're not able to and it's, they were, they lost their lives too young. There's no nice time to lose a loved one, but they were just on the cusp of their life, just as I was. And maybe I can get my life back to some extent, but they were robbed of that chance and something needs to be done. And I just think with awareness and using our platforms, then maybe it can be the start. And if I can be involved and if something positive can come out of this, whatever happens, then at least I'm leaving something good behind. And that's what I want to do, or try to anyway.